This is Nightly Business Report with Bill Griffith and Sue Herrera. Stocks plunge. The 10-year bond yield hits 3% for the first time in four years, sending a chill through the market. As good as it gets, Caterpillar reports strong quarterly results, but the euphoria vanishes after the company says its earnings have peaked. Retire comfortably. Few Americans think they can, and many are worried about not having enough to live on. Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, April 24th. And we do bid you good evening, everybody. The bulls were nowhere to be found on Wall Street today. Industrial stocks got whacked. Technology shares pummeled as high expectations for earnings season turned into disappointment. Add to that the highest yield on the 10-year Treasury in years. And you had a recipe for a rout, and that's what we had today. The Dow Industrials off the lows, down 424 on the close to 24,024. It's first five-day losing streak in more than a year, by the way. The Nasdaq was off by 121, and the S&P lost 35. Bob Pisani has more on today's sell-off in the stock market. Stocks started the day higher following a flood of earnings reports, but those gains quickly faded. And there's four issues that are facing the markets right now. First is the whole debate about peak earnings. Is this as good as it's going to get? Earnings will be strong through the rest of the year. But Caterpillar today said that first quarter earnings would indeed be the high watermark for the year. That dropped Caterpillar and the entire market in the middle of the morning. Second, rates are creeping higher. The yield on the 10-year Treasury hit 3% for the first time since 2014. The markets are nervous about higher rates because that means the cost of borrowing goes up. Related to higher rates is concerns over inflation. So several companies, including Caterpillar, talked about rising commodity costs like steel and oil. And several talked about higher wage costs. Third, there's been some major resistance from momentum names, the big tech stocks, and the FANG names in particular. So Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, parent alphabet, all about 10% or more from their recent highs. And they've been down four days in a row for the most part. Finally, consumer staples are hitting new lows. So names like Clorox, Procter & Gamble, and Pepsi are all trading around their 52-week lows. They simply have no pricing power. A lot of issues for the market. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the industrials. Today, three major companies in that sector reported earnings. United Technologies topped expectations, and the company raised its outlook. 3M's earnings were in line. Its outlook, not so great. And as we mentioned, it was Caterpillar that really set the tone. When its stock fell more than 6%, its worst decline since 2016. Dominic Chu has more details. A lot of today's weakness is being pinned on one company in particular, and that's Caterpillar. Things seem to be humming along just fine with shares of the construction equipment maker posting solid gains early in the session after reporting better than expected results and boosting its full year financial forecast. Then its earnings call kicked off and Chief Financial Officer Brad Halverson put a little fear back into investors. The first quarter got off to a slow start for project spend. We expect the targeted investments for future growth to be higher over the remaining three quarters. The outlook assumes that first quarter adjusted profit per share will be the high water mark for the year. In other words, the profits posted by Caterpillar this past quarter could very well be the best results we'll see for the remainder of the year. Yes, the forecast is still bullish, but the investor concern is that they may not see anything better anytime soon. Those comments sent not just Caterpillar shares lower, but many other industrial stocks as well. The biggest drags on the Dow in addition to Caterpillar were 3M, which fell after it lowered its full-year profit forecast, and aerospace giant Boeing, which fell in sympathy with the rest of the sector. Boeing reports its results tomorrow morning. Despite today's negativity, some experts are still feeling pretty good about the health of the overall market. We see that economic data is improving, earnings are still growing, um, valuations are still pretty reasonable, you know, we come away bullish. Um, so again, you want to make sure that, you know, volatility, disorderly sell-offs aren't the new norm, but once you kind of get past that period, um, you start to, to think things are pretty, pretty good. The sharp move lower today may be the latest sign that traders and investors need to see much better forecasts before pushing stocks back towards record highs and that the bar may be higher for the rest of the companies who've yet to report earnings this season. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Dominic Chu. 
Well, joining us right now is Patrick Shavanek. He is the chief strategist at Silvercrest Asset Management. Patrick, thanks for joining us tonight. Good to be with you. What do you think? Have earnings peaked at this point? Uh, earnings potentially will come under pressure from rising costs. I mean, there are really two concerns here that I saw trigger the sell-off. The first is that uh, interest rates, 10-year Treasury rose above 3%. Um, there are a lot of people out there who are convinced that low interest rates are what have buoyed this market. Um, I don't really share that view, but that's a popular view out there. And so that means that the market's in uncharted territory. The second is this concern about inflation, um, that if we start to see price pressures rise, that puts a squeeze on margins. It also puts more pressure on, um, on interest rates to rise. And so it's, it's really the same things that caused the sell-off in late January, uh, which is concerns about inflation and rising interest rates. Right. But I, I think that's offset, though, by the fact that you do have pretty good economic data mm -hmm. and earnings are up. Uh, they're, they're at least coming in looking like they're going to be up more than 20 percent year on year. So it's important to keep that in perspective. Right. And, you know, we've seen the 10-year kind of approach the 3 percent mark for a few days now. I mean, it was kind of a foregone conclusion by many people on Wall Street that we would hit that 3 percent mark. Perhaps it was the combination of Caterpillar's comments and the 3 percent. But as you point out, the economy is doing pretty darn well. So what's a long-term investor to do with this type of intermarket and interday uh, volatility? Well, right now, because of the, the, the downward pressure on the market over the last couple of months, um, the valuations in the stock market, uh, how much stocks are priced relative to the earnings that, that companies are making, is uh, at its lowest point in nearly three years. Now, if you think the economy is about to fall off the rails, either it's going to go into recession or it's, there's going to be a takeoff in inflation, that might be a signal that things are going to get worse. But I don't really see those things. I, I see inflation creeping up a bit, and it's something to keep an eye on. Uh, and I see, by and large, the economic numbers looking fairly positive, including new orders, which is really an indication of where the economy is going to be heading in the com months to come. Before you go, let me push back a little bit on your, your thought on interest rates and their impact on the stock market. Isn't, don't you think there will come a time when the yield on the 10-year will start to provide some competition for the yields in the stock market, and that will have a problem for equity investors? It really depends on why interest rates are rising. If they're rising because uh, inflation is picking up and there's the expectation that the Fed's going to have to push back, that's a negative. If they're rising because there's general confidence that the economic growth will continue, and that's why interest rates are rising, because stocks are actually, the return of companies is actually providing a competition uh, for funds. That's a positive thing. And, and so uh, unless we start to see inflation really pick up, uh, my money for right now is on the continuation of a positive story. All right. Patrick Chabanek with Silvercrest Asset Management. Again, thanks for joining us tonight. Good to be with you. Dow Component Travelers reported earnings that missed analyst estimates despite a rise in net income. The property and casualty insurance company reported slightly higher catastrophe costs, but also higher premiums and improved underwriting and lower tax expenses. Nonetheless, the shares fell about 3 percent in today's trading session. Coke has discovered that Americans are still willing to drink soda after all. The Dow Component reported better than expected earnings and revenue in the most recent quarter. And a big source of the company's growth came from soft drinks, especially all those new Diet Coke flavors. We've been trying a few things on Diet Coke. It's been a while since it grew. Uh, we've been learning and we've been learning what will engage uh, existing or lapsed uh, Diet Coke drinkers and what will engage the millennials. And I think the team have done a great job in, in finding something that's really got people's attention, whether it be the packaging, the marketing, or the, or the new flavors, which I think are more uh, millennial relevant. The stock, though, was down along with the broader market, falling by 2 percent today. Verizon was a bright spot in today's session. The number one U.S. cell phone carrier topped earnings estimates and added more new users than expected thanks to smartwatches and connected cars, not phones and tablets. Shares of the Dow component rose more than 2 percent, one of the few Dow components that was higher today. Speaking of which, another Dow component, IBM, said today it is raising its dividend by 4.7 percent to $1.57 a share. This marks the 23rd straight year the company has increased its payout. It will be payable June 9th to shareholders of record on May 10th. 
It is time to take a look at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. Home Depot saw its rating raised to outperform at Wells Fargo. The analyst there sees a strong economy helping the home improvement chain. Price target, $205. Shares of Home Depot were off fractionally to $176.26. BP's rating was upgraded to buy from neutral at Goldman Sachs. The analyst cites the potential profitability of BP's new projects. The price target is 54. Shares of BP rose slightly to 44.24. Still ahead, hitting the road in Beijing. Here in China, the sales of American-made cars and SUVs are growing, even though they cost thousands of dollars more than comparable models sold in the U.S. I'm Phil Lebeau in Beijing. What happens if China changes its trade policy when it comes to autos? That story coming up on Nightly Business Report. Today at the White House, President Trump and French President Emmanuel Macron vowed to seek common ground when it comes to Iran. And when President Trump signaled that the U.S. and France are close to reaching an agreement to preserve the Iran nuclear deal, oil prices fell. Domestic crude settled down more than 1 percent to 67.70 a barrel. The U.S. has until May 12th to decide whether to quit the Iranian nuclear deal and reimpose sanctions against the oil-producing nation. Well, strong consumer confidence lately has been helping car sales, but automakers do find themselves caught in the middle of tariff threats between the U.S. and China. China has said that it plans to eliminate rules that would make it easier to build automos, uh, automobiles over in that country, while also threatening to double the tariffs on autos built in the U.S. and shipped to China. Phil Lebeau, as you saw, is in Beijing with more on what is at stake at the world's largest auto market. Drive around Beijing and you see them everywhere. SUVs and cars built in the U.S. and sold in China. Teslas, Mercedes, BMWs, all popular in China and all facing a possible doubling of the tax Chinese buyers may have to pay in the future. It's a pretty severe tariff and the current proposed tariff, if implemented, is going to double that um, to 50 percent. Um, now it goes from severe to um, much more radical. Right now, the BMW X5 built in South Carolina costs just over $57,000 in the U.S. But the current 25% tariff drives the price up to $120,000 in China. A Tesla Model X built in California starts at just under $80,000 in the U.S., but sells for over $50,000 more in China due to the country's tariffs on U.S. autos. Tack on an additional ten to twenty thousand dollars if China's auto tariff were to double, and you see consumers here may not be able to pay that much. I think a lot of buyers would say, "Well, you know, at this price, I'll look at a locally produced model, um, and that locally produced model could be potentially German, uh, but perhaps more likely would be Chinese." Another factor for Chinese buyers is the possibility the Chinese government may actually lower not raise the tariffs on autos brought in from the U.S. and elsewhere. Meanwhile, if the U.S. raises the current 2.5% tariff on vehicles built in China and shipped to the U.S., like the Buick Envision, it could force automakers to rethink their business plans. The bottom line is every automaker realizes China and the United States are the two most important auto markets in the world. And if a trade war breaks out, the biggest casualty could be the bottom line. In Beijing, Phil Lebeau, Nightly Business Report. Wynn Resorts, whose founder and CEO stepped down earlier this year over allegations of sexual misconduct, reported better than expected earnings in the most recent quarter. Revenue, however, was a bit shy of estimates, and the stock was choppy in after-hours trading. Contessa Brewer has the one key takeaway from Wynn's quarter. With all the upheaval Win Resorts has faced in the first quarter, the biggest surprise is that it's hiking the dividend by 50% to 75 cents per share. 
It also announced it continues to plan to open its resort casino property under construction in Boston on schedule in the summer of 2019. That's despite all the talk of whether they might have to sell that property. And consider all that's happened to this company this quarter. It announced fourth quarter earnings January 22nd. Shares spiked 9%. Then four days later, a report came out detailing sexual misconduct allegations against CEO and founder Steve Wynn. He resigns. Lawsuits are settled. Three new women are named to the board. Shareholder lawsuits are filed. And still this company's shares are up 7.6% since earnings were last reported. For some comparison here, the S&P is down 5% in that same time frame. I'm Contessa Brewer for Nightly Business Report. Eli Lilly raises its full year outlook, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The drug maker said that higher sales for many of its medications helped quarterly profit and revenue top expectations. Lilly said that it's optimistic that its product pipeline will fuel the company's next leg of growth. We had a very strong quarter with 9% revenue growth and minus 5% on, on costs, yielding a, a large beat and uh, significant growth on the, on the bottom of the income statement. So the, the company's performing well against our priorities, which start with launching new products. We've launched nine new products in the last three years, hope to launch six more in the next year and a half. This is really the beginning of a new phase of growth for us and driven by, by new innovation for patients with serious conditions. Shares were down a fraction today to $80.09. A rise in fighter jet sales helped results soar past expectations at Lockheed Martin. The defense contractor also raised its full-year earnings guidance, but investors were disappointed to hear that the company was maintaining its 2018 cash flow outlook. Shares fell 6% to 336.49. And sales inched higher at Harley-Davidson, helping the motorcycle maker deliver an overall earnings beat. Total shipments during that period did fall, but the company reaffirmed its expectations for the full year, saying that it sees momentum picking up in various foreign markets. Harley-Davidson shares climbed more than 2 percent today to 42.01. Sue? Well, Bill, higher selling prices helped Pulte Home top expectations. Orders also rose, and that prompted the home builder to hike its home sales guidance for the full year. Shares rose nearly 3 percent to $29.65. JetBlue reported stronger than expected profits as strong demand demand helped offset higher fuel costs. Revenue also edged higher, but it wasn't good enough to beat estimates. The airline also said it expects a key measure of its revenue to fall as much as 3 percent this quarter. Shares of JetBlue fell nearly 2 percent to 1953. And the mining company Freeport McMoran missed profit expectations and says it sees copper sales slowing this year. The company also said its deal to operate a large mine in Indonesia could be delayed due to disagreements between the two parties. Shares plunged 14 percent to $16.08. And the majority of Wells Fargo shareholders chose to re-elect the bank's board of directors, even as that bank remains under investigation by the government. Investors also approved the bank's compensation plan for executives. Wells Fargo shares finished down marginally to 52.51. We all know that preparing for retirement can be stressful, especially if you have not done a good job of saving for it. In fact, a new survey out today finds that 26 percent of workers have less than $1,000 put away at this point. And as Sharon Epperson found out, that's not the only troubling finding. Few American workers are very confident in their ability to retire comfortably. And most say preparing for retirement makes them feel stressed. According to this year's Retirement Confidence Survey by the Employee Benefit Research Institute, 45 percent of workers have less than $25,000 saved. 20 percent have saved between $25,000 and just under $100,000. 15 percent have $100,000 to $249,000 in savings. And 2 in 10 report having $250,000 or more saved. These numbers include a worker's household savings and investments, but not the value of their primary home, pensions, or defined benefit plans. The survey, which is the longest running of its kind, found having retirement plan, a 401k, or an IRA makes a big difference in the amount of money workers have saved. Two-thirds of workers without a plan have less than $1,000 saved, compared to 10 percent among workers who have one. Another major finding with this year's survey, six in ten workers who are confident about retirement overall are in excellent or good health. Yet less than 20 percent have figured out how much money they'll need for health care costs. For Nightly Business Report, 
I'm Sharon Epperson. Okay, well that's scary. So <laughs> let's talk about some strategies, shall we? Christian Weller joins us now to talk more about retirement savings and why many Americans are not comfortable with their retirement plan. Uh, he is professor of public policy at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Welcome, Professor. Nice to have you here. Well, again. thank you very much for having me. It is thank scary, you. Um, you know. But when I talk to people about retirement, they say it's just overwhelming when they have to think about how much it's going to take for them to retire. They don't even get to the point where they're thinking about health care. How do we change that dynamic? Well, let's look at the scary numbers um, a little bit more, in particular the health care numbers. Um, one in four retirees, for instance, say that the long-term care costs are larger than they expected. And as we know, long-term care costs are overwhelming. Um, the, the speaking of overwhelming, saving for retirement, as you said, is sort of a big challenge. In the good news in the uh, report and the survey is that when people have a retirement plan at work, they feel more confident and they feel more comfortable. The problem is that at any point in time, less than 50% of private sector workers actually participate in a retirement mm -hmm. plan at work. Right. So that's sort of the entry point from a policy perspective. We need to do things to encourage more people to participate. Now, there is different ways we can do this. One would be asking and encouraging, we have done this through the law, employers to, for instance, automatically enroll every new hire into a 401k plan, for instance. The other way is sort of what California and Oregon are doing, and that is offering a retirement right. plan that is separate from the employer. And all the employer has to do, and would be required to do, is take a pay part of the payroll, deduct it into an IRA, and if the employee doesn't want to participate, they can opt out. But that has to be the first step, getting yeah. more people to participate in these plans. But yet, I think about that old Aesop's fable, the grasshopper and the ant. The ant's busy diligently putting food away during the summertime while the grasshopper's playing his fiddle. When winter comes, the grasshopper is going hungry because he didn't put enough away. Aren't we just a bunch of grasshoppers? We're not wired to think about the future. When, in fact, you know, we have all these incentives and these, these retirement plans that are available to us, we don't take advantage of it. Um, yes and no. I mean, all the survey data, not just the, the retirement confidence survey, but also the data sets that we have from other sources suggest that people do pay attention. They are worried about retirement. They do want to save. They find it complex, perplexing. But the other part is also they have so many other challenges. You've got to remember the typical workers' wages haven't risen. At the same time, costs for health care and for kids' education have gone through the roof. Housing costs, either rents or homeownership, have gone up for the last seven, eight years. So, so Professor, I don't, are, I don't want to interrupt you. But forgive me for that. But what about people sure. who don't have access to a 401k? Quickly, what, what should they do? Well, <laughs> uh, save as much as they can wherever they can. Um, but again, it depends on their personal situation. But I, I think asking around, finding ways to save, um, typically there are sort of tax advantage savings in the individual retirement account world. I would only caution to be mindful of fees um, mm -hmm. if you go that route. But for a lot of people, it's basically starting to build emergency savings. I mean, $1,000 in emergency savings, yes, that's not going to get you a good retirement, but it may give you some peace of mind today exactly. that will allow you then to plan for the future. Professor, thank you so much. Professor Christian thank you very much with for the having University you. of Massachusetts, Boston. Coming up, maybe you need a priceless antique. We'll talk about why Sotheby's is taking a page from the Antiques Roadshow playbook. Sotheby's is breaking records in the spring auction market. The auction house is putting this Modigliani up for sale with an estimated value of at least $150 million, the highest pre-sale value ever placed on a work of art at auction. The auction is next month. Well, if you don't have the millions to spend on an art uh, auction like that, maybe you have something valuable in your home and you want to find out how much it's worth. Now Sotheby's can help get you an estimate on just about anything. Robert Frank explains for us. Well, if you're looking to find out how much that antique vase or painting over the mantle might be worth, Sotheby's can now help. 
The auction house best known for multi-million dollar Picassos and Monets is getting into the everyday estimate game using new technology. Through its new online estimate tool, customers can email Sotheby's a photo and brief description of an object they want valued, and the company will send an estimate or response within a couple of days. Now, the program is just starting, and Sotheby's won't say just how many clients have submitted items or what technology they're using. But last year, it acquired a small artificial intelligence firm called Thread Genius, which uses image recognition and algorithms to identify objects and their values. Sotheby's currently does most of that work with specialists and expensive experts, but eventually the algorithms can help sort the treasures from the junk and send the top prospects to specialists. Now for Sotheby's, it's a great way to find new business. If we can get more supply out of your vaults, off your walls, into the market, liquidity goes up and we will have the demand to find it. Now a couple recently sent the company a picture of a Chinese ceramic they inherited from a relative and it turned out to be from the Ming Dynasty. It sold at auction for $3.1 million. Another woman sent in a picture of an emerald ring she had, and it sold at auction for $1.6 million. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Robert Frank. Wow. Before we go, here's a look at the day on Wall Street. The Dow plunged 424 points. NASDAQ was off 121, and the S&P 500 tumbled 35. And on that note, that will do it for us tonight on NBR. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.